I mean, you look naked. How yeah, long? it's conveniently flesh colored, like this game. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doop. Bloop, doop, doop. Hey everybody, uh, it is Ramin here from Houston, Texas, quarantining like a champ. I am neither Ramin nor in Houston. I am quarantining though. Um, Michael in DC, and uh, today we are discussing Final Fantasy VIII. We've been through all of the game recently, and you may have been following our play-by-play um, -play reviews that we've been writing, but we also thought we'd give a fuller review of the full game. Fully, full, full, and full. I'm probably going to not put South Park references in this video. <laughs> Fine. Bigger, longer, gun -bladier. So, uh, Final Fantasy VIII. It's an old game. If you are watching this video, you likely already know it. I figured we could just sort of jump into what our reviews were. I'm starting with the story. Within story, we have some subsections. And let's start with w the world. Some pluses and minuses of the world that Final Fantasy VIII creates. I think it's a pretty cohesive world for the most part until you get into like some of the timey or whiny or stuff. I think it's a really consistent world. I didn't think it was the most vibrant of Final Fantasy worlds, but I kind of like that about this game, that it feels sort of realistic in a way that a lot of others in the series don't, even the better graphic ones. The one area I didn't love so much about the world was the systems it had in place for religion and art and things like that. They just sort of felt two-dimensional. It sort of felt like, you know, we have Galbadia, Evil Empire, and a whole bunch of other villages. Like, you know what I mean? Um, not a lot felt distinct. Sort of in like the system side of things, I gave this, you know, top ratings for this entire section because I really do love this world. And when it comes to like the systems, I was thinking of things like the designs of Blam Garden and of Fisherman's Horizon are kind of similar. Why is that? Because it all traces back to Estar and you know, people from Estar left and founded Fisherman's Horizon. And then the people of Fisherman's Horizon built the gardens. I like how these little things all make sense. Oh, and um, the master fisherman from Fisherman's Horizon left and helped the Shumi tribe build their community. And their architecture and machinery looks similar in a lot of ways too. For the most part, the rest of it, I, I agree with you that it's an interesting world. It's it's. A, a, good, a nicely cohesive, I almost said goodly cohesive, nicely cohesive world, and it's pretty vibrant. For sure, for sure. And I think that systems are also, to be fair, one of the hardest things to get right in world building. The tropes are pretty standard, you know, high fantasy fair with some sci-fi drag thrown in. That's about it. Yeah, um, I think for me, what bothers me about the tropes in this game is just that it starts off with a lot of potential to play with these tropes. And it gets really close in some cases and then just doesn't go all the way there. It's tropes regarding gender, for example. It just feels like it, it only reaches and gets halfway to where it could have gone or maybe wanted to go. I don't know. We've got an evil empire, even though they're not the top of the chain evil for the game. Which, that was a nice change, actually, if you think about in the context of the series. Like, most of the games leading up to this, it was just an evil empire, right? Story overall, we both gave it pretty middle-of-the-road grades. All right, now let's move into characters where we can spend a lot of time. Heroes. We actually agreed for the most part on heroes. Squall. I largely find Squall really disappointing because I feel like he could be a really good character if he were not so easy to hate at the beginning of the game. If they showed us a little bit more of like a glimmer of a character that we could like in early game Squall. And if he had a more consistent growth pattern throughout the game. As you pointed out, Ramin, um, in a lot of our playthrough reviews, a lot of Squall's character growth is just a huge spike at the end of the game, or like two thirds of the way through the game. Um, whereas it would have been much more interesting and believable if he slowly grew to that. So first of all, I will say, I gave him a better score than I expected to going into the playthrough because I never really did like Squall, but I feel like a little part of the uh, teacher of young children in me has changed my opinion a little bit maybe because when I played through it this time, like beginning of the game Squall, I agree is unlikable. And I think that's kind of the point. I think really the issue with Squall is the game keeps trying to straddle this line of him being like brooding and sensitive, but also a badass because we need the male power fantasy. 
And I think if it got rid of the male power fantasy entirely, that would be better for the character because really a lot of other things about him are typical asshole teenager things. And I think that it's a bold move to uh, make a protagonist of an anime video game a dick. But I think the issue is they pulled their punches. All right, Quistis. She's no nonsense through a lot of the game, but she's not just the smart girl. She also like has a lot of insecurities that we get to learn about through the game. I do wish they hadn't like emotionally nerfed her the couple times that they did. Like she did not need to come on to Squall at that early point in the game. It is explained on disc three why she did that, but still. One of the things I like about the way they handled Twistis is she skews the line well of being a really young teacher. Because, you know, when you look at the, that character on the surface, you think that's gonna be hard to write. Like most military academy teachers aren't a year older than their fucking students, right. you know? But I think that actually, sometimes they do a pretty good job of that. And I also just generally like that she feels like a female character that even though they do that one thing, doesn't really need a romantic counterpart. And she feels powerful without being perfect. And just like a character I wanna spend time with. What I pointed out in one of our playthrough reviews is at the moment of the game when Sid just sort of drops all responsibility and puts Squall in charge of everything, without asking, Quistis and Zoo take on a lot of, or Shu, I don't know, how, how are we pronouncing her name? <laughs> they take on a lot of the responsibility for him. They, like, he shows up at the bridge and they're like, okay, we did this and this and this. And by that point, he's already starting to trust them a little bit more, so it's not like he would be mad, but also he also really doesn't know what to do anyway. And they have somewhat of a better idea because they're used to being in leadership positions. Selfie, I also love her. Uh, she is pretty standard Manic Pixie Dream Girl. But yeah, I, I like her anyway. I think she brings much needed levity to the proceedings. I agree. And I, I think the one thing that makes her a little bit less than standard is how quickly her reasoning jumps to something violent. I just think that it's great that we get a sincere moment of greeting her. She's a surprisingly emotionally mature person, given the characteristics she shows people most of the time. All right, let's move on to Zell. Zell is not one of my favorite Final Fantasy characters, and he's just sort of like the excited puppy that a lot of these games have, but he's just so intense about it, and it seems like he's the one that they dump a lot of, like, oh, this is a 90s game. Let's give him this 90s thing to do. He's sort of, to me, he's just kind of a nothing of a character. He feels like a stock Saved by the Bell character. Cooled up with the face tattoo and the hover skateboard thing. Like, why are either of those things there? Why is he the only one who uses the <laughs> skateboard? Like, <laughs> okay, moving on to Rhinoa. Again, she's just kind of there to me. She's not awful. She's not great. She's she feels like a very typical female protagonist, you know? Yeah. I have very little to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have a ton to say about her. Um, the reason I gave her a four instead of a three is that like she does a lot of like telling it like it is type stuff. She does actually exhibit a good amount of growth. It doesn't necessarily always feel like it's well paced. And I feel for her a lot. I get a lot of her reasoning for things. I think I like a lot of the plot details in her narrative more than I like her herself. Uh, like, I really think it's a cool angle that she's also a sorceress, and she also is, like, kind of the entitled, spoiled daughter of an asshole general who borderline abuses her. I like that, that, that all those angles are with her, or that she was dating Cypher. Even if I don't like Cypher, I think that's a cool way to pull her into the garden. But I just don't I think a lot of that stuff manifests itself in her personality. So looking at Irving, he's gross. There's almost nothing redeeming about him. Like as a playable character, he can be game-breakingly good. But yeah, as a, as a character. Again, he feels super anime tropey. Like so many animes have this womanizer who's kind of a doofus and charming, right? And like secretly insecure, like it's so, and not just anime. I just described like half of the comedies starring white guys of the last 15 years. He's a good example of tropes being too tropey in this game. We talked at length in our uh, playthrough reviews about how much we love Laguna as a character. 
it's just so refreshing in a Final Fantasy game at this point, especially coming after Final Fantasy VII. I just love that like all his successes, almost all his successes, he just falls into. He's kind of just your average dumbass. I think he's charmingly flawed. Heroes and Ward, I, I, the only reason I gave Ward a four out of five is just because he's so bland compared to Kiros and Laguna, but he's still like, uh, he's there and what happens to him is sad. I'm just gonna keep saying it until it's a thing. Final Fantasy VIII 2 starring Laguna, Kiros, and Ward, prequel game. I will buy it. I will buy the remaster. Let's do it. Come on, Square. You know what I would really like to happen in that remake? Is if they make Kiros queer. <laughs> I think it would be so great. Kiros. All right, let's move on to villains. First uh, one I hate is the worst one. Cypher. It's just, he feels like, I, I think we've said this, like a stereotype out of like Top Gun or something, which just does not fit the rest of this game's aesthetic in my opinion. Another thing that we talked about in our playthrough reviews is that they're trying to make him this histrionic villain that a lot of the Final Fantasy villains are, like telling you all of their machinations and stuff like that. And it works really well for Kafka and Kuja especially, I think. They're, they are delighting in how evil they are, but Cypher doesn't even know that he's evil. He thinks he's doing the right thing for at least most of the game. Yeah, and yet his dialogue doesn't do a great job reflecting that, right? He's always sort of taunting Squall. His claim is that he's trying to protect the sorceress, which is a bit more passive than like taunting someone into combat. Why is he always sneering? And so, like that overtly evil behavior, I would have been more okay with and is more explicable when he's not possessed. Yeah. Because the whole way the sorceress clearly possessed him the whole time was deceiving him and playing with that. So it would have been interesting to see him either more obvious of a failure throughout the game, like if even the other villains are pointing out more often how he's not doing a very good job, or if he were an actual real threat. At one point he talks about wanting to hunt down all of the seeds and kill them. Why didn't he do that? It, that would have been a, a more interesting plot point if we had to stop him somehow. <laughs> the closest we got was when he finally led the attack on Balam Garden. But at that point, it felt sort of diffused to me and it didn't feel like he was leading so much as like, this is what the school was doing. And Putin and Ryzen also both suck. Yeah, let's, I don't even really want to talk about them. Why not? I like President Delling and I really like Adaya. Those are really kind of the... Yeah, the potato villains to me of the game, which is weird because they don't even last halfway. Yeah, they're, they're the strongest two. President Delling is gone by the end of the first disc, and Idea is no longer an evil sorceress possessed by Ultimacia by the end of the second disc. I think that also they're a lesson learned for the devs in terms of, again, laying these dominoes and foreshadowing well, because the game does a great job of talking a little bit about the sorceress, but then the president's the main villain, actually, for a lot of the first disc. And you really only confront the sorceress by the time she's off to the president, which highlights how tough she is, because you already had to go through the tough-ass president himself, who barely had to actually lift a finger to beat your plan. Right. And it just, like, it was a good use of storytelling, because it slowly but surely makes it clear how fucked the party is, and it raises the stakes that way. By like keeping that fish out of their reach for so you know, not fish, carrot stick out of their reach for so long. Yeah, the fish on a stick probably wouldn't work as well for most people. I think President Delling and President Shinra are both very similar in that they are this like corporate slash government figure each that is a real threat, but it seems like a real world real threat, like like our real world real threat. And it would be really interesting to see the heroes of a Final Fantasy game fighting against them in that way. I do wish that we had like one more set piece that he got to pull some strings and be extra evil about, but he makes way for the best villain in his death. Part of what makes her so great is just, she's so cool and calm and like practiced in what she's doing the whole time. I'm just gonna keep using Seven. When you compare Sephiroth, who is for many people the most biggest, baddest villain in the series who like, does all these crazy sword moves and is jumping and flying to Adea, who stops a bullet with just a wave of her hand. 
You know what I mean? She is more threatening for that reason. Like, in the battles, you're running up and hitting her, but she's just standing there and just goes, no. I love all the little touches to her, like, in any battle that she's in, no matter what side of the battle she's on, when she appears, you hear the little jingle of all of her, like, accoutrement. <laughs> also, the sorceress battles in general have some of the best battle music, actually. Or, like, really all of the music that relates to the sorceresses in any way is... Yeah. The best well, music. Even <laughs> Elsa. Our other favorite villain. <laughs> Norgy. A lot of the time it's just so much like, wait, what? There's a slug person in the basement? Norg does drop one of the actual like bombshells of the game, but it's in such a poorly presented way that it's just like, what awful married couple next sorceress adele is another one i wish they used more she's no no um adea but she is amazing and uh threatening she, i do think she plays on some gender stereotypes that are pretty fucked up giving her more masculine features if that was not intended to be like ooh this woman is extra scary because she has masculine features. I don't know if that's why they did that, to make her extra scary, but they should have assumed people would read it that way and done something about it. I would have liked to see her more, not just in the battle. It is cool to see her like imprisoned for so much of the game, but if there was some way that she could have like telepathically communicated or something like that while she was imprisoned, that would have been interesting. And then we have Ultimatia. Ultimate Kia. Ultimate Kia. Ulta, Mecca, Machina Forbidden. She's my second least favorite gotcha Child. at the end of a Final Fantasy game. I think, honestly, everything we said in the written review is really all I have to say. I don't even remember most of what we said in the written review, but I'm sure it was brilliant. NPCs, uh, we can sort of fly through these because most of them are not that interesting. Like, Dr. Katawaki, it's cool that the doctor's there to call Squall on his shit first thing in the game, basically. Well, and that she has a name and has more than one line and has, you know, consistent presence throughout the game, even if it's small. And it's interesting that she does sort of take up some of Sid's role once he shirks all of his duties and tries to be the adult in the room. Why is this game, like, I just suddenly realized it's all the women in Sid's life take over for him. Quistis and Drew and Dr. Katawaki and all that are going to save you and yeah. maybe Squall. Okay, so the women and children, the women and children that surround Sid do his work for him. This right. is the subtitle of this game. Let's just jump into Sid then. We both rated him poorly. I think I would have liked him more if he had somehow been punished for his behavior. Like, he does own up to the fact that he just runs away, but, like, <laughs> and... Like, I ran away and had let a bunch of 17-year-olds do my job for me in saving the world. Right. He, like, says... You know, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. And then he offers no further help. Zoo, shoo, shoo, shoo. Probably shoo. He's fascinating. I would not have minded her being a party member. At least temporarily. Yeah. She's she's so interesting. And she's just not a good teacher. Well, doesn't have, we don't know how she is actually at teaching, but she doesn't have a good teacher-student rapport. I like that she's like, not nice and also powerful, but also not really sexualized about it. It isn't one of those, you know, like, oh, you're so not nice and mean, mm, like a Lulu situation, you know what I mean? Yeah, she's just kind of a jackass. Alone. I wish something more deeper. <laughs> that, that's all. Again, another example of they keep giving us like little spurts, but they don't really give us a whole lot. Like, I, I feel like I hear more people talking about Elone, and that's, I call it Elone, I don't know if I said Elone, but I feel like I hear more people talking about her than I hear her talking or see her doing things. I feel like all of the powers that people have in this game are explained. They come from GFs or they come from being a sorceress. Then she's got her powers that are neither. Which just so happened to be the powers the entire game hinges upon. Yeah. Well, for president, that's all I want to say. Oh yes, Ma Dinged. <laughs> I mean, she's fine. She's not even really like the best video game mom. She's just a super realistic one, I think. Yeah. I feel like everyone knows that mom. Zone and Watts, what I like about them is that they feel like they're real people who have like real goals and aspirations oh. and values. 
but they just don't know what to do about it most of the time. What I like about them and the timber sequence in general is how subtly the game hints you in the entire time of how futile the whole thing is. But not enough for the average player to realize it until it's too late. But yeah. like observing Zone and Watts, it's clear that they are the only people in town less competent than Renoa who she would be able to hire in the first place. But they're also like really sweet. Zone, other than his porn obsession, is a sweet guy and gives up his ticket to Quistus when she doesn't have one and like forcing him to be stuck in the occupied town and he can't escape. Watts is just like totally gung-ho to do whatever is needed and he's like, yeah, I'll go find information and I'll tell you what you need to know. Be back in a minute. Okay, Rain. I, I actually kind of really love Rain. I like Rain. I think I gave her a three because again, I just wish the game had explored her more. It feels like there's so much to her, even in the very short amount of time we do spend with her. Even in like the three scenes that she's in, she's got a really multifaceted personality already. Whereas the yeah, her others, dialogue is well handled, yeah. yeah. Whereas the others who we haven't seen as much as her don't have any character development or, you know, interesting character points to show for it. Or if they do, they have one and she's got a, several. Moombas. Fuck Moombas. So I understand the developers not putting Moogles in the game. They don't fit in this world, but then they shouldn't have had any cutesy animal. The function they serve in the story is bad. They're always subservient. They're, they're basically always slaves, except for the ones that live in Shumi Village. And it's just like, no, no. Uh, we could put together the Master Fisherman and Mayor Dobe and Flo all together. The master flow of Mayor Doby Fisherman. Yeah. I like that they are just very real feeling people in this world that is so different from everything else in the game, but it makes sense that it's so different because the people who live here do not want the politics and the war and everything else from the rest of the world. Yeah, Fisherman's Horizon always feels like the break in the game for a whole lot of reasons, including the fact that this whole time these characters, these teenagers have been basically raised to be violent to the point where they just take violence for granted. It's just part of their life. It's almost as much of a shock, I think, to the player character in a way to encounter this pacifist town. I also like having the mayor confront Squall really and, and really forcing Squall to think about why he fights. So many JRPGs have a what, what are you fighting for scene, but they mean it differently than this conversation. Here the mayor is saying, you should be able to solve this problem without fighting. And it forces the game to reckon with itself in a way that nothing else in the Final Fantasy series does. You have to fight in this world because if you don't, you will literally be killed. Um, well, it's not too different from the real world. I have to say, I like how average so many of the NPCs in this game feel. Like so charmingly average. I kind of like it as an anomaly in a series that is mostly otherwise, you know, big drama and, and stuff. Um, and the NPCs are maybe the best illustration of that. Well, I think part of that that makes it work so well in this game is that the worlds of both Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VIII feel the closest to ours. And having all of these normie NPCs just makes sense because most people are pretty normal. I also, you know, that I love Dr. Odin. Like I said before, there aren't a lot of like chaotic neutral slash ambiguous scientists in Final Fantasy. A lot of them are either evil or good. And he is just kind of like, oh, if this, if I'm fucking up a child's life to do research, okay, that's fine. Am I doing it? <laughs> no. I'm gonna find something out? Sure, okay. When it comes to diversity especially, it's disappointing when they show you that people of color exist in this world, but there might only be one. I'm not even sure that there were any black NPCs, come to think of it. I don't think so. There are two, they're not NPCs, but I can think of two characters who are people of color. Though this is one of the best Final Fantasy games for feeling good about gender stuff. <laughs> one thing that I do feel the game doesn't really explain enough is why is Renoa a good sorceress, but then the rest aren't? And like, I guess it's because Ultimacy is possessing them, but then what about a death? It's like, and then her powers manifest with the angel wings, but everyone else is just like, it's, there's just too much special about Renoa as a sorceress that I don't get. The game actually does explain that. Adea straight out says, that every sorceress that does not have a knight becomes evil. 
That's not better. <laughs> That's, worse. That's worse. That is a, a really major shitty point, but they have powerful women of different types in different roles throughout this game. And you know, aside from Ultimacia, I can't really think of a single woman that's like super sexualized. I get you maybe if you make that argument about Renoa's outfit, but not really. It's pretty normal. As Molly said when we did our feminism and, and JRPGs video a long time ago, Renoa's outfit looks like something you could see someone wearing on the street in Japan. Probably not. Or here. like maybe on a runway, but like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looks like Japanese streetwear. Okay, let's try to gauntlet these. I said that about the last section and we didn't. Though it's very Nomura belts and zippers, I love it. I love Squall's costume. It's dumb, but in a fun way. I do wish that Quistus' costume didn't have that little belly window. Quistus' costume looks to me like what a like early term pregnant woman would wear if she were expecting to need to go into labor in combat. Like, it's pink and cute, but I can move around in it. It's got a little room at the belly. Like, <laughs> what's going on? Zell with those jorts. We just talked about Renoa. Irvine, just... All I said about Irvine was I've beaten this game three times at least in my life, and I still don't understand that. I can get the shorthand of putting the guy who thinks he's cool but is not cool in a cowboy hat and a long coat. Laguna, Kyrgios, and Ward all feel like they're wearing things that make sense for them. None of them can do any wrong. They're all perfect. Next. <laughs> Cypher, fine. Yeah, his costume's fine. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's, it's what's it, on the inside that's shit. Raja made me feel some feelings when I was 12, y'all. Adele's costume is amazing, and I love it. And yes, forever, please. Adele, Adele what Adele is actually wearing does help add to her imposingness which I feel is effective. Ultimacy is terrible. Everyone else is appropriately normy, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, no, the other one I really wanted to talk about is Mary Dobe and Flo. They're, they're just wearing, like, Mary Dobe is wearing a Hawaiian shirt and khaki shorts. They are two years into retirement, and they're not going to have anyone else tell them otherwise. And he's wearing a bucket hat, too, isn't he? And Flo is wearing, like, <laughs> capris and a simple blouse. <laughs> Flo looks like she is forever baking bagel bites for the like soccer mom dinner. But in general they the costumes are pretty interesting and they make sense. Yeah. Dialogue we really liked in this game pretty much every review said so. Graphics okay if we compare the graphics to seven and nine you know the games on either side of, the, of this it's mostly an improvement over seven when you're getting into this more realism though it's when the things that are not good are more glaring like squall's face <laughs> basically is one of the you know there's a meme about it so if you compare it to nine nine just feels so much better but it's because they are living within the system's limitations and going for a not realistic looking game. I will say, having played the remaster, as I think I said in an review perhaps, that this is by far of these remasters that I've played the uh, biggest difference in terms of visuals and audio, maybe not audio, but visuals. Even though it did look better, like it's, it's still, I mean, you can still see the cracks, you know, because like, as you said, it was harder, especially in that era, to achieve Realism. The one thing that's really nice about I think is that even though there are problems in the graphics, the FMVs feel really consistent to the gameplay in a way they absolutely did not in 7. Yeah, and some of the best moments in the game really uh, effectively use FMVs in ways, as you say, a lot of others of that era, pre-PS2-ish era, didn't. Um, because like the, the Adea parade where they're running, you know, in the crowd and with the CGI float or the um, desert base falling apart and you're, you know, trying to get across the ledge while it's sinking to the ground. Or like one of my favorites um, in the Battle of the Gardens, when you're mm -hmm. running with Rhinoa through this battle and it, there's this really beautiful battle going on behind you, which is then like blurred out to make the focus squall on Rhinoa as they run through. And it works really well and looks really mm -hmm. nice. Okay, design. The one thing that I want to talk about is transportation, because the Ragnarok is the dumbest looking ship. <laughs> Why does it have yeah. hands? Why does a yeah. ship have hands? Also, um, the Balam Garden, there were uh, just a, two or three spots on the world map where you can kind of 
fuck your way into a spot where you shouldn't be, you know, <laughs> like, because it has that weird floating me mechanic and it can sort of skew boundaries in ways that, like, you know, the, um, the vehicles in past games did. But yeah, the Ragnarok was stupid. I do like in general how this game, not to the not to the extent of how well Seven does it, but it is nice that you have real limitations with all of your transportation options, where it effectively limits your exploration. A flying school is kind of a dumb idea as a transportation option. I mean, it's cool looking and it's a cool idea that it flies, but using it as your main mode of transportation for most of the game. You want to move on to sound? Though I think there are standout moments in eight that are better than anything in seven. As a whole, the composition in seven might be more interesting, but eight does feel like a really believable midway point between seven and nine, or really between six and nine. There are some themes that just sound so similar to a game that either was right before it or came right after it. I think the, big, the biggest thing for me this soundtrack has going for it over others in the series is orchestration. I think they orchestrated it very well. All right, gameplay. Moving around any of the towns and dungeons and the world map feel pretty good, but then you have the other transportation options. The chocobos in Final Fantasy VIII make me feel fucking dizzy. The garden moves just a little bit too slowly. The Ragnarok feels fine. The cars and trucks that you can drive at different points are just like a hair too hard to do it. <laughs> The control system on the vehicles feels especially rigid. I will say the remastered triple play really does improve Garden, but even with that, yeah, navigating to that white seed ship was no bueno. Just to transition to battles and everything that entails in this game, as fun as it is to break, it's pretty easy to break this game. It doesn't take a lot of intuition to realize, oh, Ultima's probably gonna be good in my magic stats or, you know, whatever. Yeah, and then the card system too, which again, it's all right there. It's on the first GF you get, I mean, to card modify and then all that stuff. It's fun, but even though I don't mind a challenge, it's just for me a little too easy. If you are the person who likes to go through and spend hours in menus, and find the absolute best setup, then you'll probably really like this. Because there are so many things you can do and you can basically become invincible by the middle of the first disc. If you're the person who likes the challenge to track with you or likes to be consistently actually challenged, then this system is probably not the one that you're gonna like. One thing I really like about this game that I don't think is talked about much is the leveling system and the way the enemies level with you. I just wish that it were implemented with a little more detail and a little bit better. Because if I remember, I think the tiers are something like level one to 15, and then like level 15 to 30, and then like 30 to 100, yeah. or something ridiculous. Oh God, um, yeah. And you know, I just would have liked it to be a little more specific, but I actually would love to see more RPGs implement something like that, you know? Because a lot of people have talked online about how like grinding can ruin the fun in games for some people. And there are some games that you just never have to grind. You definitely don't have to grind in eight and you'll be fine. But if you do, then you'll be more than fine and it'll be super easy. <laughs> and while these systems are cool, again, I just think uh, they didn't balance them that well. Okay, now let's hit mini games. So I do think Triple Triad is fun. Triple Triad without a lot of the other rules. The Lamb version Triple Triad is a really fun game. One minigame I hated was the Chocobo Forest. I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was that hard most of the time. There's one, there's one of the forests that's just like dumb. You have to move the kid out of the way. Like, come on. It felt fruitless a little bit. Like, yeah. why do I need a Chocobo when I have a giant floating military school? Everyone's got one of those. Now the thing that I hated so much, way more than the Chocobo Forest, are the two duels that you have in the game, especially mm -hmm. the dragon one. It took me so many tries to get that. Really, for me, the garden one was worse, although I hated them both, yes. It just doesn't make sense that these characters who in battle are like running around are suddenly like, oh, uh, oh. Uh. And then the press square really fast, which is kind of a running theme. Yeah, there's <laughs> so many times in the game you just have to mash the square button and it's just like, come on, why? Really, if it, if it were just triple triad versus all of these, it would be fine. And the games overall would feel, the mini games overall would feel fine. But the fact is you're forced to play all the bad ones and you never have to play the good one. Camera works really well in this game. The learning curve is 
straightforward and easy and works pretty well. So all the scores that we gave to these little mini sections, we gave the game the same score by our all these little mini scores averaged together. We both gave it an 80%. Our heart scores, the scores that we think the game deserves without even thinking about all these little minutia. Like if someone just asked me on the street, out of 100, what would you rate Final Fantasy VIII? I said 83. When you average all of that together, the game overall gets a 79%, so a C plus. Personally, I think it's like a, a B game, but C plus is not too far off, that's fine. I'm kind of torn between like a C plus and a B minus. I don't know, I just, I think the, the thing that really holds me back is when I think about what the games that are adjacent to this game got right. It's frustrating because it's almost like opposite Ville a little bit with eight. Eight has great NPCs that seven lacked, but it doesn't really have consistent plot hooks the way that Seven has, or like a, a compelling villain, main villain, the way that Seven has. Well, it has a more compelling villain for half of the game. It really does, to me at least, feel just a little unfinished. Also, the biggest knocks against this game, we already talked about one, how Paul is so unlikable. The game doesn't treat his unlikableness appropriately. The other one is just that ridiculous plot twist. We all grew up in the same orphanage and we just forgot. Yeah, I don't understand why in a game where the main setting is an institution that unites us all, that we need another institution to unite us all. It's so frustrating and it just comes out of nowhere and is not needed and blah. What we said in one of the mini reviews is with the GFs messing with your memory, after someone says, I wonder if the GFs made us lose our memories, then Quistus is like, oh yeah, I read some research on that. Like, yeah. Could we have found that research at in disc one? That would have been cool. You know when that would have been great to mention? When they got Ifrit. Yeah. Like, hey, well, hey, whoa, whoa, before you do that, uh, let me tell you something. That would make everything feel better. It would add some strange dread that would otherwise be unexpected in a video game like this. Yeah, well, and it's also like the junction system really isn't explained that well at the beginning. And what does it look like yeah. when someone junctions a GF? Yeah, because when I saw what it looked like when Adele junctioned Renoa or whatever, I don't want that. The other little missed opportunity that we talked about is some of the themes that we wish they had gone into a little bit more, like motherhood versus, versus fatherhood, the idea of a sorceress and her knight, and how that like devotion is sometimes really good and sometimes really bad. I would have loved to see that moment when Adeo like crushes Cypher psychologically. Like he fails and she like just insults and reads the fuck out of him and is like, you aren't really my knight and you're a piece of shit. And, you know, like, uh, that, that's gold. Again, they do it a little bit. Or how the father figures are bad at being fathers. And in general, the mother figures are good at being mothers. It really is like a game of a bunch of women holding male dominated institutions up. The only other thing that I think would have been interesting is if they really had made Ultimacia Renoa. Because it's a fan theory, and I, frankly, on some playthroughs, I just pretend it's true, because it's a lot more fun that way. Yeah, it, it is a really fun fan theory. Oh, well, the, the, the two big fan theories, the one that um, Rhinoa is Ultimacia, the other one is that Squall is dead in discs two through four, and it's all living out in his, like, instant before death brain. Makes the wildness make a little bit of sense. Dang, the first disc of this game is so good. And if the rest of the game were as good as the first disc, it would be the best Final Fantasy game. And that was the only other thing I wanted to say, is that I do think that they've missed a lot of opportunities with the memory thing with GFs that would have been more impactful or cooler even than the stupid orphanage idea. <laughs> Especially when you then later work in the theme of time compression and time travel. Like, you could have made that whole CGI end sequence also, like, a cool dungeon where you have to remember the right shit that happened and not the wrong shit and, you know, like piece time back together. And I realize what I'm talking about could potentially add hours to a game that was probably already packed, but you don't have to make it that complex. Disc 4 did need something else. Because really- The question just feels too clean, I think is what I feel. Disc 4 is just, you fight Adele, then time compression, then you go through the last dungeon and fight Ultimacia. Like there's nothing else. It would be cool if there were one more optional dungeon or if you had to try and save people who were trapped in the time distortion somehow. And, yeah. it, it, and like your idea of 
saving people by fixing memories would be really cool. Yeah, or like, I, I keep saying the only other thing, and then I add one more thing. Going along with that, and we said this in the review too, but just to reiterate, it's so funny to me that um, time compression visually affects the real world so little. Like, other than the barriers outside the towns, everything looks exactly the same. Yeah. And when you compare it to almost every other game in the series that has a world of ruin at the end like that, it's just strange to me that they didn't do that here. Missed opportunity. It makes the discs feel unbalanced. And again, it just makes both Ultimacia and time compression feel less threatening. Why did we build all this up? So that we could just close the town gates and then continue as normal and play cards on the ship? Thanks for watching. Um, hope to see you next time with whatever we review next. We'll be getting into 1987 next, so if there's any piece of media from 1987 that you would like us to cover, let us know. We might look into it. If we like it, if we don't, we won't do it. And to sign off, I just wanted to tell you that um, I'm, it's a little embarrassing to say this, but you know, I'm always attracted to people who are really good at musical instruments. And your harp playing is just so sexy. Bye. I mean, what? <laughs> well, I just want you to know that whenever I sang my song on the stage on my own, whenever I said my words, wishing they could be heard, I saw you smiling at me. Was it real? or just my fantasy. You'll always be there in the corner of this tiny little bar. Does not rhyme!